a talk on mangrove is crucial because they are the most vulnerable plant forms on planet Earth. Because of their nature, the way they are, the character, they are at the interface of sea and land. Most of large ports are exactly where they are. So there has been huge amount of degradation, deforestation of mangroves just for large ports to come up in the tropical countries. Some of the most uh, important financial capitals on Earth are also along the sea. Bombay is a great example. Uh, we were seven islands a few centuries ago. And I'm sure if you were part of the ecosystem at that point, maybe some of us were, we don't know. Uh, all those islands were pretty much surrounded by mangroves. The reclamation work that started, and today, as I was born, I know Bombay the way it is, it is almost impossible to imagine that there were mangroves everywhere. There were crocodiles, some of the largest reptilians on Earth, existent reptilian, uh, the saltwater crocodile, popularly called the salty, was found here. Fortunately, they still survive in India, in Odisha, that is Bitar Kanika, and neighboring forests and Sundarban. The most dominant species that you see, the mangroves that you see when you are in a train um, from Bandra onwards, you on the left hand side on Mahim, those are Avicenia. So that's the most common species, the Mahim Nature Park or the Maharashtra Nature Park. And that is actually truly the most polluted part of Bombay. Uh, and those species there are also heavy senior. So what I'm saying is, if you go to Sundarbans, you will see nearly 40 species of mangroves. And Sundarbans I talk of because it is the largest uh, mangrove forest on planet Earth. If you add the Sundarbans of India and the Sundarbans of Bangladesh, then we are looking at 7,000 square kilometers of mangrove forest. India is about 2,800, the remaining, the larger chunk is in Bangladesh. But the Indian side of the forest is better protected. Uh, there are nearly 75 tigers. I have been fortunate to sight a few tigers in Sundarbans. When I am in a mangrove swamp, and if I don't see any city, anywhere in the periphery, I feel like I'm transported 300 years back in time. That is how our forest would have been. It's almost impossible for a human being to survive in a mangrove forest for more than two or three days. He cannot or she cannot drink water because it's salty. In the sea, there will be sharks because mangroves are uh, plants that grow in the delta which means the silt that the rivers deposit is where, where they grow. So it is the best of, the both, best, best of both worlds, that is the fresh water coming from one side and the salt water. So it's brackish areas, highly nutritious, a lot of prey, and so there will be predators. So you have tigers on land, you have sharks and crocodiles in the water, honeybees. It's a fantastic place, in fact, some of the most um, nutritious honeys are produced by uh, bees found in the mangrove areas. Uh, it is slightly bitter in taste, so it's not so popular, but it's very healthy. Just about 15 days ago, I took my family to the Thani Creek area to see flamingos, and they were just about to go back, and we saw nearly, I would say, about five, 6,000 flamingos. But in a peak season, you could see almost 20,000 there. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that. We are so lucky you still have wildlife left. Uh, jackals used to be common once upon a time. And when I was growing up, and I'm talking about 20 years ago, we would see jackals easily in Sanjay Gandhi National Park. Today, the only place where jackals remain in Bombay are in the mangroves, because mangroves are very difficult for dogs to go in. Dogs do find their way, but they, they, it's not very comfortable. I mean, I don't want to get into the terrestrial ecosystems, but jackals are indicator species. They used to be very common 
till 20 years ago, and now the collapse in jackal population across the country is almost um, as high as 85%. If you go to places like Kanha, if you go to places like Pench, you keep seeing them and you feel, wow. But people who have been driving in through the villages, we don't see them anymore because of the roads and the dogs. Lot of disease get transported onto the jackals because of dogs and the roads are killing machines. Jackals are crepuscular animals, they come out in the evening, they get blinded because of the lights and they get killed on the roads, road kills. The only two uh, organisms on this planet that can build land are mangroves and corals. So Lakshadweep islands are coral islands. Over millions of years, calcium has got deposited and land is formed right in the middle. And then you have mangroves, which are right out there. It's a miracle because think, I mean, we all love the water. We go to the beach, but it's difficult to stay in water for more than two hours. So these guys stay there, breathe there, because I don't know whether you have, I mean, people, there are many people who I'm, I'm sure know, but marshlands have a lot of carbon in it, which is good. So carbon sequestration is high, but the oxygen content of marshes is, is very low. So trees like uh, the banyan tree or the pongam, I'm talking about the native trees or those beautiful uh, bombax trees and the coral trees, they cannot grow there because the roots are used to taking nutrients and oxygen from the soil as well. Mangroves are the only species or group of plants that can survive in extremely poor soils in terms of oxygen. There is a myth that mangroves are, they like salt. There is no connection between salt and mangroves. Most and all species have a mechanism of getting rid of the salt. Some do it by filtering it right when they're taking the water at the root system. Some throw salt out from the leaves. Some store them, store salt, excess salt in the bark, and some drink a lot more water to dilute the salt that's there in the body. Right? They can pretty much grow in non-salty areas as well. So that's important. So their adaptation is largely because of this marshland, and that's why the roots have got modified. This type of mangroves, these are, uh, I'm not, I'm, I will take a few scientific names, but don't worry about them. Um, the rhizophora has prop roots or stilt roots. As you can see, those roots that are exposed currently are because it's low tide. At high tide, almost the water reaches where the leaves are, okay? So think of roots as your palm. And where, so you are actually holding soil like this, yeah? So they are, so what happens is the sediments that the rivers are bringing along with them. Again, another myth that sedimentation or silt in the rivers is a bad thing. A lot of people say, yes, sediments because of anthropogenic factors, that is because of erosion is bad. But if there was no sedimentation, you would not have the most productive floodplains of India. The Gangetic floodplain, the Brahmaputra region. Why is it so nutrition? Uh, nut nut uh, there is so much of nutrient in that soil because every single year, those rivers get flooded, along with it come a lot more mineral than they carry otherwise. So mangroves are holding on to those sediments, which means those sediments are not going into the sea, which means the turbidity of the water is going down, which means the corals are doing well. So people will think there is no connection between mangroves and corals, but there is. Because corals are animals, they need sunlight. 
And so if the depth is too much, you won't have coral growth there. But if the water is turbid, again, you won't have diversity there. Because of the mangroves, who's filtering out the sediments, the sea has obviously, don't imagine Bombay Sea. Because the turbidity of the water in Bombay Sea is, we all contribute to it. But if you go to the best, uh, if you go to Andamans, uh, if you were to go to Papua New Guinea, uh, or some parts of uh, Indonesia, you will see that even where the sea river is meeting the ocean, the water is turquoise blue. Yeah. Um, and so the root systems are important. Remember that two different types of root systems. So I'm not going to get into great detail, but so this is prop roots, and those are breathing roots or pneumatophores. So both these roots are utilizing oxygen from the atmosphere. So there are roots running parallel in below the soil, and from there, these pneumatophores go out. So this is, you actually cannot walk through this. Yeah, this picture is from Borneo. Okay, this one is from Sundarbans. But you have uh, the Avicennia and the Sonoracea, those two species which are very common, Almost, I would say, 90 plus percent of all mangroves, uh, the green cover is because of those two, have pneumatophores. Look at this water. This is uh, Brahmaputra getting into the sea on the way. There is mangrove. This is Sundarbans. All those whitish leaves is where the river, so it's during high tide. Yeah? And that is extremely important for the diversity. This is low tide, extreme low tide. You can see pneumatophores there. Yeah. Even in uh, Bombay, during low tide, you can get stranded there. On certain uh, creeks, the water level goes so low. Uh, but you don't have to worry. You can sit there for six hours seven hours. We have got stuck several times in Sundarbans because it's a large forest. Even when you plan it, things go wrong and you get stuck. Uh, this interplay, so this is an intertidal area. So those are, so I'm throwing some points at people. So intertidal zone, breathing roots, capacity to throw salt out or not allow it to enter and capacity to hold sediments. Keep that in mind. Because the land gets exposed, you have a battery of uh, animals that can live there. And they work in shifts. Every six hours, there is that. So you have crabs. You have zillion species of mollusks. Very, very important. And you see those leaves there on the left, some leaves. And leaves are providing nutrients in these swarms. Because, uh, and because of the nutrients that the leaves of mangroves provide, you have some highlands within the mangrove patch. In fact, which are mangrove, but it, is, it gets wet only a few times in a year. And you can have grass there. And grass seeds can cover thousands of kilometers. Yeah? Sometimes animals bring them. They can get stuck on birds. And you have meadows inside Sundarbans that support wild pig, that support deer. And I'm sure many, many years ago, there were spotted deer in the mangrove swamps here as well. Again, a typical place inside mangroves. You cannot, I mean, now it looks like you cannot walk. But even if there was water, you cannot walk. Because those things are there. It's just that you don't see them. Right? And in these, you have tigers moving. And it's quite fascinating to see how they've adapted the importance. I told you flood protection. Um, we have suffered massive losses because of 
flooding. It was because we tempered with the mangrove ecosystem in Mahim area. Carbon sequestration, any woody plant will take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, store the carbon inside, throw the oxygen out. And the ability of this planet to take uh, carbon dioxide has gone down because the degradation. India is 21% forest on paper, but good quality forest is less than 50% of that. There is nutrients from this water, fresh water, there are nutrients from the sea, and that becomes a nutritious soup. Young fish spend the early time of their life, the coastal fish, I'm talk not talking about the deep sea ones. And mind you, India has a huge population of fishermen who depend on the sea for subsistence. We are not talking about the commercial fishing. We are talking about people who are dependent purely for nutrition. They all fish around the coast because they have small ding dinghies, they cannot go deep inside. All those fish breed near the mangroves. But the chemical factories that are there in Bombay, their chemicals are also being absorbed by mangroves. Mangroves are actually filtering a lot more toxins than you can imagine. But some study was done. I don't know if the figures are right, but currently the toxic load that we are putting in the water, it's six and a half times more than what mangroves can assimilate. Food is not just fish. It is also shrimp, prawns, uh, there are several other species, crabs, that they collect. If cyclones and tsunamis, we cannot control. We are playing some role as far as cyclone goes and the frequency of hurricanes. But tsunami, of course, we have no control over. But if Bombay had mangroves the way it had in the past, human habitation would, by default, be one kilometer away from the seafront. We are so close that if a tsunami happens, which we have no control over, you can imagine what it's going to do. So if mangroves were there, mangroves cannot stop the water from coming, but they will displace human beings. So they will not allow people to be close to the ocean. And just because of that, a lot of lives can be saved. We think climate change, anybody, if I ask you, why does climate change happen? You say because the trees are cut and because uh, we are pumping a lot of carbon. But the, another important factor is loss of biodiversity. So even if a forest is standing, if the species diversity goes down, you are going to throw much more carbon out. In other words, if there were 11 species of mangroves, one acre patch which has 11 species of mangroves and another acre that has only one species of mangrove, the difference will be three and a half times in terms of carbon sequestration. So that's crucial and that is irreversible. You can replant some green areas. It will never be the same, but you can replant, but you cannot get the biodiversity back in that same proportion because what you see now is a product of millions of years of evolution and comp competition between species. You cannot say, okay, this forest is gone. Let's regrow the forest, let's put a tiger, let's put a ant, let's put a mushroom. We will never be able to achieve that. So we are tampering with systems which we don't know how to rebuild. So ecosystem services, finally, all of this, in some way or the other, are those ecosystem services that are being provided by forests. Mangroves are playing a regulatory role they are provisioning us with food, protection against a lot of things, cultural, just feeling of well-being. You can be sad on a day, but how do, I don't know about you, but if I'm sad, or if I don't even know I'm sad, but till I go and stand under a tree, I suddenly feel, you know, hey, I feel good, yeah? It's very important. We don't even talk about that. People are trying to, put cost on forests. 
ecological economics. They are saying the valuation of forest and it runs into trillions, but what they cannot measure is the cultural part to save that forest. Somebody says, leke jao. Somebody says, oh, my dead body. Right? So there is no limit to how much. And so we cannot ever put whatever we estimate. So there was a team of scientists from Indian Institute of Management, Forest Management, IIFM. They, they did some valuation of forests. Sundarbans is a mangrove swamp. They did in Ranthambore. They choose areas where tourism was happening as well. But their conclusion is that the value that they've estimated is 3% of what it actually is worth. Because there are a lot of non-tangibles that you can never measure. And also, what you measure is current NPV. But the value of a forest is just not today. Human beings, the way we are, that is Homo sapiens, have been here just how much? 160,000 years. 0.16 million years. And we think we know more about the planet than the mangroves or the termites know. Regeneration. So when you see these young, so there are roots. So obviously those are not going to transform into stem. But this thin, what you see, are all regenerated mangroves, which means these are next generation mangroves. Another interesting adaptations, and they are all, most of them have viviparous um, reproduction. What it means, I will not get into great detail, but the embryo grows, continues to grow, even when the seed is up on the tree. So it actually becomes long, fleshy, and it becomes heavy, and it falls, and it is horizontal like this, in turbid waters. But when it goes into clear waters and it finds it becomes vertical and it floats and then it hits ground and it starts propagating. Everything about them is so unique. Everything about them is so fascinating that you feel like a kid in the candy store even when you're 45 years old. And then there are these tiny things and nowadays with great cameras, you can do time lapse. And if there are some photography enthusiasts, they should go and sit near a marsh just when the tide is receding and keep your camera there for about five hours. Amazing amount of traffic jams happen there. All these snails, this is just one species you see, but there are so many crabs will come out from there and they write stories on the swamp. People like us go, naturalists, and they read that story. And a new story is written every few hours. Then these are march pasts. These are mud skippers. Mud skippers are unique fish. When you look at them again, see, as an ecologist, what happens is when you are standing here, we have frozen time. We look at things as this beautiful building uh, we want to say something about this land. It's very difficult. But in nature, if you are an ecologist or if you're just an enthusiast, you look at a fish who's coming on land, it tells you, hey, this is how terrestrial animals must have first invaded land. This is how a mudskipper looks. He's climbed up a new metaphor. So he can actually breathe from the air, but live like a fish whenever needed. And if there are predators outside, it can go underwater or it can come on land. It's amphibious. Wherever there is prey, there are predators. This, I love this snake. It's semi-venomous, but you don't die if it bites. That doesn't mean you want to hold it in your hand. Uh, it's called the glossy marsh snake. It is very common. There's another dog-faced uh, sea snake. Uh, it is on land, it's, a, it's again, most of these are semi-venomous. The true marine snakes, the braids, they are all venomous. These are semi-venomous, uh, this, this is slightly larger, and they stay in burrows like this, originally made by crabs, and they take over, 
and they stay near the mouth and they know exactly when to catch food. So they know exactly the, the tide and they come out and make the most of it. Obviously, we don't have this beautiful reptile in Bombay, uh, but this is the king cobra and it is very commonly sighted in mangrove areas. It is the largest venomous snake on earth. A king cobra can grow to almost 20 feet in length. It is the only snake on earth that builds its own nest. No snake builds nests. The only snake that builds nests with leaves, collects leaves without limbs, bamboo leaves, needle, pine needle leaves. If it is in Uttarakhand, then they use pine needles. When they are in the Western Ghats, it uses bamboo leaves. When it is in mangrove areas, it will use mangrove. And in mangrove, it knows where to lay eggs because it cannot get flooded. Another reptile very uh, successful again in uh, mangrove areas is the water monitor. Uh, I don't know. I don't think we have mon water monitors in Bombay. But in Bitarkanika, in Sundarbans, in Southeast Asia, in Sundarbans, I have seen uh, individuals almost four feet, as big as four, you know, four feet long, massive creatures. But they can't beat the estuarine crocodile. Uh, as I told you, a crocodile like this can maybe in 100 years become 25 feet long. This individual uh, was about 12, 13 feet. Uh, that's also not small. Uh, obviously, mangrove swamps are a great place for birds. This is, uh, these are all pictures taken in the mangrove swamps in Bombay. Black-bellied tern, uh, a common tern, but uh, it does very well in the mangrove areas. Another expert feeder, especially in marshland, look at the bill. It is down curving, it is long, so it can feed in marshes of varying depths. And it feeds on grubs, invertebrates in the mangrove swamps. Again, evolution happens because of uh, geographical, climatic, and also because of competition. So say if I was having a, if there was a tree which all of us were to, and we were not climbing, so think about a giraffe. It will go and reach out, and the neck has gone up so that it can outcompete other animals. In birds, either the neck goes long, the legs have to be long if the neck is long, yeah, and the bill. Some of the most fascinating uh, adaptations you see in birds in bill structure. And the mangrove swamps have these very, very specialized feeders. So this is a wimbrel. But wimbrel are everywhere. They cannot go very deep. And mangrove swamps, I told you, can be this deep. Nature had an answer for that. And you have a curlew. Eurasian curlew, much larger, goes much deeper. So wimbrel and curlew will feed at different depths. To Avoid competition. And then you have what they cannot achieve in the big beak. They will achieve it by having long necks. This is a great egret. And it is a fish eater, but it will not say no to a snake or another, a crab or whatever. So it pretty much eats everything, but it feeds in uh, on animals that are swimming in the water. Those two feed on animals that are deep inside the soil. So they feed at different times of the day. So when they can feed even in high tide, whereas those birds in high tide will be sitting up on trees. When the water starts going down and when the invertebrates start getting active is when they come down, egret by then has already eaten and burped multiple times. And then you have much larger animals who are feeding on Dead animals, so vultures do well on land, but the uh, adjutant stock, 
It's a massive animal, so if I was standing here, I think an adjutant stock, if it keeps the bill up there, it'll be taller than me. But if it's standing, the head would be almost this. Nearly, nearly four feet tall, and then kingfishers. The maximum diversity of kingfishers, obviously, you see around mangroves. There are seven species of kingfishers that you see, um, and more than that, in fact, in the Sundarban area. But in Bombay, you see several species as well. All those that are found in the freshwater are found here. This is the stock-billed kingfisher. But you have the small blue, you have the uh, white-breasted, you have the pied, black-capped kingfisher. They are all found in the mangrove swamps. Eversets, again, see the bill structure. In the Wimbrill and the Curlew, the bill was down curving. In the Eversat, it is up. And of course, my favorite, uh, the flamingos, uh, the greater, which is that tall white bird, and the pinkish birds are all the lesser flamingos. Both species come here. Uh, here, you see these birds are swimming. The ones in the water are swimming. They come to Bombay in large numbers, nearly 20,000. They breed in Kutch, uh, in the flatlands of uh, Kutch, where the temperatures are nearly 50 degrees. The salt concentrations are extremely high. Some of the most hostile ecosystems on planet Earth. No predator can go where the nests are. But they pay a price because of that, and sometimes, um, it's so hot that it gets desiccated. Salt starts getting accumulated on their limbs. So every, so it's like ice forming on your limb. You have salt and babies with a kg of salt have no hope. But if not for that landscape, flamingos will go extinct because they will not be able to breed anywhere. They build their nests of mud on the ground. They're very vulnerable to predation. And that is probably the only place where human beings cannot go and live. We would love to, I'm sure. So they will build canals one day, fresh water will go, and that they want to convert into some crop field or something, hope not. We will fight it the very end for that. But these birds, so remember that if you have to protect a species, you just can't protect it in their wintering ground. You have to follow them wherever they go. So protecting birds is becoming extremely difficult. It's easy to protect a monkey, easier to protect a snake or a frog, because they don't migrate so much. Birds migrate so much that even if you can give the best protection in the feeding area, their nesting site, if tomorrow some uh, mineral is found there and the government decides to mine it, uh, so we have to give our proxy votes. So we have to be ready. Looking at pictures, um, it feels good. You feel charged up. You say, hey, wonderful animals. But what we have to understand is that they have hope in hell. If we don't, and we as in, we have to have a multiplier effect. Bombay is the financial capital. But do we have enough voices in Bombay? Are you all irritated by the way the trees are being cut? But how many of us take that discussion beyond the lunch table? Ask yourself, uh, we need to. We need to allow such gatherings to metamorphose into action. Because otherwise, it's all these beautiful talks. Um, we all understand the problems. I'm not giving you any rocket science out here. But at the end of the day, collectively, probably we are spending, if there are 300 people here, we are spending two hours plus two hours of travel, four hours into 300. Wings on fire, they call them. Uh, and then there are mammals. You have the rhesus macaque, uh, which is rhesus macaque are found above the Godavari. Uh, so you, if there were mangrove swamps, so in the Nagla block in Sanjay Gandhi National Park, you have an animal that looks very much like this, but the coat is different. And that's the bonnet macaque. So they are very similar in their behavior. This is right in the middle of Sundarbans. Uh, and human beings are worried about tigers. Macaques go down like this to feed on 
And macaques are omnivores like us, so they feed on both plant and animal matter. And so when the water goes down, there are some um, animals, invertebrates that they feed on. And then mangroves don't uh, just grow on their own. Human beings can feel good about them, but they, we don't plant. Mangroves are planted by bats, pollinated really. Um, so a lot of these mangroves are bat pollinated. Uh, thousands of bats in Sundarbans, in Borneo, in, in wherever you go, wherever mangroves are, there are several bat species. This is the giant fruit bat. Um, and it's, it's very pretty, and I'll tell you why. Uh, four feet plus wingspan. More noisy than the Vankhede Stadium when India is winning. They give birth to twins, so you can sometimes have babies under sides. I have some photos where you have same thing with two babies clinging onto the mother. Uh, very important, one of the most important ecosystem services of a forest, of biodiverse forest is dispersal. And you have grass, as you can see here. So what mangroves are colonizing the ocean. They're creating the substrate and succession. See, this is how it is. So for all you know, just imagine, as is theoretical, I sometimes think like that to understand how things would have happened. It's an ideal, so I'm removing all the assumptions are all in favor of what I'm thinking, is that we had small land, mangrove came, they started building land, and they, because of their nature, they wanted to be at the interface, and they left the things behind for other trees to come in. That's exactly how it has happened in Sundarbans also. You see these grasslands, uh, and now the deer have come in, um, monkeys, and all these. That is an indirect evidence that a hungry cat swam through this creek and went up. And you can see every step, it has gone in and out. Very muscular. Uh, in Sundarbans, Sundarbans is in West Bengal. The human density of West Bengal can compete with Uttar Pradesh. Especially the Sundarban neighboring areas, it's very, very dense human population. Uh, so all these tiger attacks that you keep hearing about is because there are large number of people and very poor, so they risk their life for honey collection, for prawn, that is aquaculture, fishing. So And for prawns, they have to walk through the, near the banks. So they are vulnerable uh, both to shark attacks and tigers. And we have worked there for quite some time. And the government has no compensation for crocodile and shark attacks because the government says, you know they are there. Why do you go in the water? But they have compensation for the tiger. Because Project Tiger is a uh, wing. We, India has done a lot for tiger. So many a times, crocodile and shark attacks are also blamed on the tiger. But somebody like us who, who works with them, uh, and we have gone and actually looked at the injuries. And you know a tiger injury is very different. Even an 80 kg tiger is not going to bite off anybody's hand and leave that person alive. The first thing a tiger does is to break a neck and go for the juggler. Never will a tiger hold on to your hand and say, please give me your hand. That doesn't happen. Or your leg. It won't happen. It will snatch life out of you first, and then it will decide which part of the body he wants to eat. And that's not true with crocodiles. And crocodiles especially, they will hold and then turn. So those injuries will have fractures also. Whereas shark will have a clean cut. So when you actually go and talk, you realize that nearly 50% of the injuries are because of those two animals, which are blamed on the tiger. So that's why tigers are considered to be because the compensation for tigers is much more. In Sundarbans, you don't have large mammals. The largest that they can have is a pig or a deer. That deer will weigh about 25, 30 kgs. So mostly the tiger is fishing, 
eating crabs, eating small monkeys. So it's a snack all the time. And so he's traveling so much more and not skating actually on the marshland. So he's becoming smaller. So he, he can therefore survive in lesser amount of food. But if he gets a warm blooded animal, his instincts will kick in. So he says, Are, ye crab chawa chawa ke daang duk gaye mere. So this so there are attacks, definitely more, but that's because people go into the forest much more because human life is not as valuable there because they are very, very poor. In their minds, they cannot say, okay, I will not go because it's about starving, you know, or risking your life. This young tigress made a mistake of going into the village to catch a goat. And 500 people ran after her. She went up a palm tree. She was so scared that she went up a palm tree like a monkey. Sitting on the palm tree, people were throwing missiles, fire bombs, everything on them. The forest department took two hours to reach because people were cordoning them off and they beat up the forest department, get, this is your tiger and you are doing this to us, whatever. I mean, I can understand why these things happen. Fortu she was fortunate that they could go tranquilize. She fell in the net and uh, she was recuperating and that's when I had gone. So this is that tigress. Eventually, she was released. Uh, surely I was there. The water is almost 15 feet below this cage. It's the most uh, fascinating moment. I was not proud that as a human being I was helping a tiger. But somewhere, again, I was talking to myself and I was saying that all these people, they are earning 12,000 rupees a month. There is malaria there, cyclone most of the times. They don't see their families for three months on, and there is no fresh water, mostly. They create fresh water pools. That water gets filled up in monsoon, and that water they have to purify and then have. Or they, can, they have to go 2,000 feet below the ground to get the water out there, and that will also be hard water. To see those people risking their life, because a tiger doesn't know they are there to help him or her, right? When you see such things, you feel there is still hope in hell. <laughs> People dependent, honey collection. Uh, governments, they are doing livelihood programs in several areas where uh, uh, honey is being sold. But, so Fab India, for instance, and such other stores are trying to um, help these communities, not help really, you can't call it help, but there is a business model out there, which is good. Everything that makes economic sense will propagate in this world. And I think rather than crying about how, what all we are losing, we have to get our economics or our antenna up and see how we can create successful models wherein there's a win-win for the forest, for the communities who live there and for us. So I'm not a monocultured wildlifer. But I see more sense in protecting these so that businesses are more sustainable than to make like a shooting star in the sky and then disappear. And we as a species are under threat of disappearing. And those species which existed much, much before us will survive, out, out, outlive us. This is renewable. The business, if it is low footprint business where the big trawlers are not going, a man and a fish, he will be successful once in 20 times to back a big fish. And therefore, a fish will do much better than a trawler who will just do a broad search, not search for a large fish, just take one entire scoop, whatever comes there. By the way, when fishing happens that way, 65% of what they catch is called a bycatch, which is all thrown on the beach. Most of it dies. So actually, you are using 35% of what you are catching. So when you go to a government setup and you ask, tell them that, oh, you know, this community there is fantastic. They are doing fantastic stuff. Come here, see how they are managing their ecosystem. Obviously, 
communities also have a limitation that they cannot see in the future so much. They will not know whether that what they are doing is damaging the environment or not. They can only know after there is a time lag. But let us say they are doing something. When you go with a plan and a model like this, the government says, oh, prawn, this is the best place for prawn. I think what we must do is give subsidies to them so they can build, they will do aquaculture. So these people who are now risking their life because of sharks, crocodiles, and tigers will now not have to do that. Clear up the mangroves, build aquaculture ponds, give them some imported prawn fries, which will be genetically modified so that all of them will look the same, because then you can export it also. And there is scalability, and they will start making those calculations. That's how those big dams come up. That's how this thing comes up. But if there is an economist here, tell me if by doing this, there can be economic sustainability. There won't be. Because every now and then, there'll be high tide, there'll be flooding, so there will be a shock. So these things are, can run like this for 15 years. Once in a while, you have a storm, and this thing can get, get destroyed. But the next generation, who has never fished like their parents did, cannot go back to the old styles. So there is only one directional movement, which is from a low impact, more sustainable harvesting, to a high negative impact, high yielding, but irreversible harvest uh, ish, uh, business. And this is happening all over. So think about Gujarat. Places where they were growing groundnut. And groundnut obviously is used for multiple things, for oil as well. Because it's very dry, it doesn't require too much water. And there are herbivores there, so you have to whatever. Now you have water canal going there. All their groundnut feeds have been converted into sugarcane. Sugarcane needs a lot of water. The canal water will come in till the climate arouse, ar allows that. But 20 years down the line, when the monsoon fails for five, six continuous years, they can still survive if they go back to groundnut. But they will not be able to go because they have pumped so much fertilizer in it that it becomes, and there is so much of uh, leaching that happens. When it becomes dry, all of those toxins will come out. Create reverse migration. Not only will you declutter cities, but you will create people who will stand for the rights, and they will be an indirect vote for the forest. They may not understand mangroves the way I understand or you understand, but they will. They don't have to, because they take it for granted. This is there. I, I want the shade of the mangrove. I don't care whether it is called rhizophora or tizophora. And that is what, so sometimes people ask me, how do we conserve? I said. It's not easy at all. You cannot conserve by putting money. You cannot conserve by building forests. You have to conserve it by managing people and going back. So they're allowing people to do what they were doing. And with technology and our understanding of social sciences, I'm sure with their old models, there has to be a hybrid model. Energy, solar, wind. So hybrid models, decentralizing energy, working with communities, using old methodologies, and market linkages, so that they have forward and backward linkages, and there are no middlemen that can be done through your mobile technology. So you can have something where there is no marketing required. You have to build those linkages, and I am seeing more hope now. So I was hopeless in my mind 10 years ago, but now with all these few successful out of 1,000 startups, one or two do well, so I'm not such a big fan of startups, but those which have worked well, can be utilized in getting these ecosystems right. So when you tell me uh, what is the solution to this, the solution to this is because these mangroves are not giving shade to you and me, we can feel bad about them and but get sleep. But if they were providing those services to those people who go there every day, this will not happen. This happens in the border between Sundarban, Bangladesh, and India. And mostly from Bangladesh, people come in. There are a lot of pirates there because they are economically even more backward than India is. 
and so they take even greater risks. But as a result, the, so not, we are not insulated. This is a, the globalization that we know of now, back during the ancient times when you had uh, the Yamamamis uh, and the Mayans, when something went wrong, and it was all environment, all past extinctions, other than those because of volcano or because of big climate change events, were because of environmental degradation. At that point, it was localized. So if a problem happened, it stayed in that local locality. Today, a refu refugee crisis in Syria will affect the most powerful consortium of countries, so much so that one of the most powerful decides to get out of that, right? Refugee crisis is not contained in one. Things like this, so we say, okay, India may be protect. No, if we don't take care of Bangladesh, and why? You must all as Indians also feel ashamed that we as a country, we have built barrages. And Ganges water is being taken in India, much more, Brahmaputra rather, Ganges also. And Bangladesh, there is not the kind of water that they require. Okay, so a refugee condition in Bangladesh could have been triggered, maybe partly been triggered by us as well. For instance, uh, another issue, I was in Borneo, why did I go? I, was, I didn't go there to see proboscis monkey. But I came to know that Borneo is undergoing huge, they are losing 52 or 55 square kilometers of rainforest every two months. To put it in perspective, Sanjay Gandhi National Park is 103 square kilometers. So they are use, losing Sanjay Gandhi National Park sized rainforest in four months. And then when you go deep, there are activists there, friends, we went there to see. And in India, we don't use illegal woods. So our uh, logging and all that is now, everything is legalized, so a lot of our forests are protected. But Indonesian wood is smuggled into Malaysia, Borneo as an island. Borneo is not a country, right? It's three countries. So Indonesian wood goes into Malaysia, it is legalized there, and it is being bought, the largest buyer of that wood is China and India. So those, one Sanjay Gandhi National Park in four weeks or in four months that is going, India is responsible for half of it. So global policies, so people who are interested in global policies also have a place. You don't have to be a tree hugger to protect the environment. You cannot, you, ca you can target policy. If you're a writer, write. If you're a painter, paint. If you're a photographer, take pictures. You don't have to be a biologist anymore. That's again something that's so beautiful. Otherwise, what do you want to become? A doctor. What do you want to become? An engineer. What do you want to become? Now, it doesn't matter, I'm a historian, somebody will say. And you can do much more for the environment than a biologist can. The last one is not the least one. It's very important uh, because for that you don't need a degree. You don't need to know the name of the tree or a mangrove or a fish, but you can still spread awareness. So don't wait till you become David Attenborough. For all any movement to happen, one person cannot, they can form a nucleus, but this movement cannot happen if people have a think alike, right? Unfortunately, we have a lot of patience and resilience and we feel proud about it, but that means that we only start swimming when the water is here. Uh, so it's not that it's not happening, the fact that uh, these guys are running education programs. The fact that Kids for Tigers is doing something, that is how big changes happen. Uh, as a chemical engineer, I can tell you that there is, when a river actually changes course, you will have a five second WhatsApp which says, oh, look at this, because it looks dramatic. But that course of the river changes with one eddy. And one eddy is in nano scale. You can't even see that. So it sounds very poetic. But there is no easy solution for that. So it can only happen if there is a, that the people who feel for the mangroves 
exceed the threshold. So that awareness is the most important thing. That's why I said all those things you can only do if that minimum number of people that you require for a mob comes together. So you also have an equal role. So we are doing, but it will never be enough. It has to happen bottom up. So for instance, the climate adaptation and the climate is at the forefront of all the discussions. But mangroves don't take a, and we are not able to use the red plus. You understand R-E-D-D -D plus? Um, anybody? So basically when you have zero forest or degraded forest, and you do certain activities to bring the forest back, and the carbon it sequesters has a market. And now, globally, they have also added this plus. The plus means it's not just plants which will stop degradation. Red, 1D is degradation. The other one is deforestation. So when you reverse that and you can bring biodiversity back, then you get a better value for it. So currently, there are these models. See, why things are not working, and I'm sure you will understand, is because the economic models are not there. So when you do a small thing, it works. But to scale up, it doesn't, because it is not a linear thing. Because most natural ecosystems, and I'm sure you understand, are cyclical. And we measure growth, and all our businesses we look at in a linear form. So we say, I want the production of this particular thing every month. But that's not going to happen because flowering season is fixed. Seeding is happening at a fixed time. Migrants are going to come in at a fixed time. So you will have to have a model which traces that. And so your definition of a successful business model will have to be catered to the natural systems. And therefore, currently what we are trying to do is our, our limited understanding from the business world, we are trying to bring it into the, I mean, that's the first step, I agree. But now we have started realizing that it's not going to work that way. We have to reduce our expectations from those businesses. So collectively, we may not have an answer, but individually we are doing something which has not degraded the environment because there is justification for each one of us to destroy the last patch of green. If we talk of equity, we said we want to kill inequity, then we need to convert the forest back into more cities, more towns, all that, right? But it's not happening that fast. There are organizations who are fighting this. And till lately, the government was not going down upon them so much. Now it's not easy to fight battles, but there are still people who are fighting them. And so there is you know, freedom of speech here. And I think that has a huge amount of power. And no matter what it is, the biggest thing is where you see in a most educated family are still rooted. Their lifestyles are still very simple. Comparatively, I'm not talking about the skewed things that we see on the cine world. But generally, I've seen people who have simpler lifestyles. We don't have five SUVs in a house here, apart from five or 10 houses on this planet, on, on, on the country. So that is something that we must, and I think, so the most successful conservation uh, case studies are from India. Tiger populations have gone up in the last 10 years. Elephant populations have gone up in the last 10 years. In Africa, 35,000. In Africa, the population is how much? One seventh or even less of India. I'm talking about Kenya, which is highly populated. There are some countries where it's much, it's like a magnitude less. Yet, Africa lost 35,000 elephants last year. And there, there is shoot at sight. So you could, if you, there is a poacher, no question asked there will be a stand gun or a machine gun and you can kill a poacher, okay? Yet 35,000 elephants were poached for ivory in Africa. In India, the elephant population itself is 30,000. Yet we lost just 20 elephants to poaching. And most of these elephants see a human being every day. So it's not like we have a Serengeti, which is 30,000 square kilometers, 
where there is no interaction with people. Our average protected area size is less than 150 square kilometers. Serengeti Masai Mara is 22,000 square kilometers. And there they lost elephants. In Kruger, they lost elephants. Indian population of one horned rhino. India has pretty much everything that there is in terms of one horned rhino. There are about 2,400 one horned rhinos in India, which is 95 plus percent of all rhinos, one horned rhinos. We lose about 40 rhinos every year through poaching or something. Kruger National Park, where again there is shooter site, they lost in one year 700 rhinos. Two rhinos per day. And here the rhinos are living right next to people. There is lot of conflict, yet there is no retaliatory killing. So there is something, right, which we don't have to go to school to learn. And I think that is the biggest, uh, uh, I mean, it's inspiration. And this I can tell you because my organization works in 23 states of India. From Northeast to, you can name it, and pretty much from Ladakh to Kerala to Arunachal to Gujarat on this side to West Bengal. So I am not talking from one or two stories. I have seen it over and over again with vegetarian communities, with non-vegetarian communities, with communities with different cultural systems. I was in Karnataka um, in a place called Nagarhole. Nagarhole and Bandipur are near Mysore. From Bangalore, they are about four hours away. From Mysore, about one and a half hours away. But I was outside Nagarhole between, say, there is a, it's a tri-junction, basically Karnataka, that is Nagarhole Bandipur, and you have Vainad. And in Tamil Nadu, you have Mudumulai. So that's the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. And that landscape alone has 2,300 elephants. Elephants, four tons, 4,000 kgs. Forest is dry and most of it is dammed, so the rivers are not everywhere, so you have only one area. So they migrate from the Karnataka side to the Kerala side, and in doing so, they obviously get out of the forest also. There is no boundary. You cannot build a wall. You cannot contain elephants in a wall. It's impossible. They will destroy this wall. Also, they can destroy if you have four or five elephants here. Okay? And so I, when there, I had some meetings, and unfortunately, the moment I entered the forest, the people who I was meeting, that is the chief conservator of forest, and the PCCF, that is the principal chief conservator, head of the forest force, was there. And they said, we have to rush somewhere, and we'll do our meeting, but ab about four hours later, join us. So I said, okay. In the car, they said, a young man has been trampled by an elephant in a tribal hamlet. He was in the jungle. The hamlet is inside the jungle. So they were tense because people are, and normally these are politicized because there will be some MLA who says, oh, your elephant is because he wants his vote. So sometimes people get beaten, their vehicles get burnt. I have gone through this many times, but the quiet people were not fighting with us. When we went, they were all quiet sitting, and there was a mother sitting over a dead body who was covered. Obviously, elephant death, it's not low bloody. So you know, it's had a very blunt injury. So there is, so it was there and she is sitting and she is hitting the chest of the boy. And uh, the, the lady was saying, who had asked you to go in the jungle at four o'clock in the morning? I had tears in my eyes and I, when, I, when, I, when I talk to you right now, I'm not, um, it's difficult to say this, but because I have seen people losing family members, I have lost family members, right? Through age, through illness. And it takes us so long to get out of it. And we blame something or the other all the time. Sometimes bad luck, sometimes something. And here there's a mother, and he's a bread earner. He's, he was 22 years old. Married, had two children. Nowhere on this planet Earth Will you find people who will try to first introspect when something like this happens? It's very easy. 
to blame an elephant because the elephant is not going to say anything, right? So it's very easy to blame something outside the room. And she is not, she is not saying that, and when she looked at, and obviously they knew that the forest department was coming, she is not looking at them and saying that we will kill every elephant that comes around our village. That was not there. I think the best example for conservation is here because we don't do conservation outside of us. It is part of our mind. Thank you.